So, uh, today I'm going to be talking about the carrier strike group, or the idea of a carrier strike group, and then I'll detail really what that is. So, if we look at the idea of a strike group fundamentally within the Navy, let's say, what it is is pretty simple. It's a combination of different naval units in order to create synergy, in order to create a more efficient, more effective fighting force. And apologies, my nose is rather blocked today. A carrier strike group tries to do exactly the same thing, only it's based around the core of an aircraft carrier. And again, fundamentally, the aim is to be a battle group and to be more effective as a fighting force. So, the naval side of a carrier strike group employs different naval units, destroyers, frigates, submarines, but I will get to that later. The real aim, or the unique aspect of a carrier strike group is that it has carrier facilitated power projection. That is to say that you can project air power around the world, which I believe I talked about at some point earlier. That's incredibly beneficial because you're not always going to have a base or the infrastructure you need to be able to launch air assaults, I guess, or air defenses. So it's rather important that one has a versatile base with which one can operate worldwide and project air power in that manner. So, when you accompany air power that can be project projected as well as surface and uh, submarine fleet power, you get an incredibly potent fighting force. As we've said, the core of this idea of the carrier strike group is that it has naval and uh, air force power projection. And what this means is that when you combine all of these units together to form a large synergy, it can operate independently, and it's designed to do so, to be able to do so, and to be self-sufficient. And while it can operate it as its own fighting force, it can also operate as a larger fighting force. And you can implement, you know, a lot of different units, even multiple carrier strike groups together, in order to create something more <coughs> potent, excuse me. And so you get these sort of uh, building blocks, effectively, in building from ships to stri strike groups to carrier strike groups uh, to sort of multiple carrier and non-carrier strike groups to multiple carrier strike groups. And you can effectively build up a larger and larger synergy the larger you go, while still maintaining in independent operation, which is incredibly important considering that uh, the NATO carrier strike group, like a lot, is NATO compatible. Or oh, sorry, the United Kingdom carrier strike group is of course NATO compatible. So it can be implemented with other NATO carrier strike groups and create, you know, an enormous fighting force and something that has enormous potential uh, for projection of air and naval power. So the UK's carrier strike group in itself is pretty incredible. Over the past couple of decades, within the 21st century, it's had a couple of iterations too. So first off, what we saw was the carrier strike group that operated from 2006 to 2011, at which point it was dissolved, which was based around the core of one of the two Invincible class aircraft carriers. So that is either HMS Illustrious or HMS Arc Royal. It's not Egg Royal, but rather Arc Royal. Uh, these carriers, notably, of course, carried the Harrier GR9. And eventually, while this strike group was dissolved, as all of the Harriers, as well as HMS Arc Royal, were retired, HMS Illustrious, I believe, did continue on for a while. But fundamentally, that was the first iteration of the 21st century British uh, carrier strike group, which clearly operated quite well. And so, I believe after the year 2015, <coughs> it was updated. You have the introduction of Queen Elizabeth class carriers. HMS Illustrious continued for a while, but eventually, I believe she went out of service prior to the new carrier's introduction. And so during that time, in order to maintain the ability to operate within a carrier strike group, 
British naval forces trained with other NATO nations, I think, France and the US notably, and effectively utilised their aircraft carriers for training to maintain the ability to do so. Now we have the new iteration of the carrier strike group, and that revolves around two new carriers. That's the uh, Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers, including HMS Queen Elizabeth and her sister ship HMS Prince of Wales. And I think in regard to the new carrier strike group, obviously it's incredibly potent. And the Royal Navy does an excellent job of describing it, so I'll just read out what they say. Here is how the Royal Navy describes the strike group. Fast jets, helicopters, destroyers, frigates, nuclear submarines, support vessels, minesweepers. They're all vital pieces of kit, each with their own role to play in the modern Royal Navy. But put them together with a state-of-the-art aircraft carrier at their centre, and you have a fighting force that's as potent as it is flexible. And that's a brilliant way to think of things, because it really does create a flexible fighting force, despite the fact we think of, you know, these massive weapon superstructures, <coughs> excuse me, as such lumbering behemoths. And I think what's really important to remember in this is you know, quite how enormous and powerful these carrier groups are. So it's rather difficult to sum up, but I think I should probably just stress that a carrier strike group, it's the amalgamation of advanced weapon systems combined to make super advanced mega weapon systems in the form of ships, which themselves are combined together to make this behemoth fighting force that's, that in itself is an advanced mega weapon system synergy superstructure and all of this is integrated and modified with brilliantly advanced systems through the integration of air power so it's just incredibly versatile incredibly adaptable and incredibly powerful by definition so i'll actually go through the i guess mainstay units of the carrier strike group now so first off the type 45 destroyer now, these warships are, of course, famous, notably uh, for their air defence, which is incredible. I believe they can attack sort of air targets from 70 miles away. And they've also been, you know, used for humanitarian aid and anti-piracy purposes. But they really are brilliant auxiliary addition. Uh, protective class, I guess. Next, the Type 23 frigate, which, of course we know is getting, or somewhat being replaced in the near future with Type 26, Type 31, and Type 32. So, it's a really versatile vessel, and they are still person, they are still a really rugged super weapon system, uh, and the mainstay of the frontline fleet, and while they've been used a lot in the past for protecting maritime trade routes, their ability comes in their implementation of helicopters, <coughs> really, excuse me, my apologies, uh, and anti-ship capability as well in an auxiliary sense, in that they can fire, you know, a lot of anti-ship harpoon missiles from, I believe, 80 miles away. Next, we have the core of the entire concept, which is the Queen Elizabeth class carrier. So that's HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Prince of Wales, which are the most enormous, sophisticated warships in the Royal Navy. They have state-of-the-art equipment uh, to provide a global sovereign base for up to 40 aircraft at a time, each, I believe. And they really have incredible capabilities of their own, which I'll detail later, which sort of synergize with the other ships. The ship itself can accommodate up to 1,600 sailors, aircrew, and commandos. So that really does just give you the scale of the ship itself. Next, we have that which is needed to support it, obviously, the Tide class tanker, which is uh, the Royal Fleet's auxiliary fast fleet tanker, or I guess the superlative of that fleet, uh, which is designed to carry out replenishment at sea operations. So they refuel the other vessels in the carrier strike group 
and try to minimise disruption going on to operations. They are defended themselves, uh, which is, you know, it's a common misconception that they're not. They have phalanx guns, and, like every single other ship that I've mentioned so far, they can implement helicopters, and that's something really important. So, first off, you have the Wildcat helicopter, which is described as the Royal Navy as the eyes and teeth of the carrier strike group uh, for destroyers, for frigates, and its full name is, I believe, the Wildcat Maritime Attack Helicopter. It's small, fast, agile, and it's armed with Marlet missiles, meaning it can, it can take out these sort of small, uh, urgent, but I guess you'd say nitpicking threats. So it can attack uh, small fast boats, fast attack craft, and it carries Stingray missiles to neutralize submarines, which is pretty important. The Wildcat also includes, or has added to it, heavy machine guns for supporting onboard uh, search and operations to provide overhead cover. So it's also got this sort of auxiliary role as well as its classical ISR and attack roles. Next, of course, we have the Merlin. There are two variants of the Merlin, Mark IV and Mark II, that are still implemented. So they each have their own different role. Mark IV is used by the Royal Marines. It's used for search and rescue, general transport duties, and it is armed with uh, guns, effectively. The Mark II, on the other hand, is designed to spot threats above and beneath the waves and uses incredibly advanced radar and sonar. And once it spots threats, it can use guns, torpedoes, and depth charges to try to take them out. And of course, it would not be an aircraft carrier if it couldn't carry fixed-wing aircraft. The Royal Navy uses the F-35 Lightning fast jet, which is, I believe, the world's first fifth-generation fighter. And obviously, it's a joint strike uh, and air superiority fighter, so it has pretty incredible air superiority capabilities as well as stealth capabilities in order to pack a punch and strike at targets. Uh, it's also got the implementation of SVTOL systems, which is short takeoff and vertical landing systems, and it's got a top speed of Mach 1.6 with a 460 nautical mile combat radius, which of course is an incredibly long way, meaning one can project air power an incredibly long way. Next, there is the implementation of submarine systems, namely the astute class Hunter Killer Boat which is the most powerful attack submarine in the Royal Navy. So, obviously, submarines have huge ISR value, that's intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. But they also pack a punch themselves. They can launch Tomahawk missiles. They can launch Spearfish torpedoes, which are uh, really devastating if they actually do hit. And the Astute class, it's agile, it's stealthy, it's maneuverable. And of course, it has all of these active target engagement capabilities. So it can gather vital intelligence and then actually strike itself. So I thought just to finish off, because I realize this is dragging on slightly, I'd mention four stats, which I think are quite good, uh, that really solidify the power and the prowess of the carrier strike group. So in regard to speed and durability, the Carrier Strike Group can ca uh, travel up to 500 nautical miles in 24 hours. It can track up to 1,000 moving targets at a range of 400 kilometers. And it can strike accurately at targets on air, sea, and land, utilizing several forms of uh, ships and aircraft and <clears throat> personnel as well. Speaking of personnel, they can draw across all branches of the Royal Navy. So you have Marines, you have actual crewmen of the Royal Navy, you have the fleet air arm, you have just incredible differing roles that all come together to create this incredible synergy. That is the carrier strike group. And I think that's probably where I'm going to leave it for today. So thank you very much.
please do, do go look it up.